Okay, before we head in uh, to the market outlook, a few updates on the applied level. Interest rate futures has been added. Uh, you'll find that in the futures folder that is in the options series. I cover ZQ, which is the Fed Fund Futures, and I cover uh, SOFR one month and three month contracts. This week in sector studies, I will have the energy sector up and a video in the energy sector as well, understanding oil and gas, uh, energy and production, and I'll be using Oxy as the case study. Uh, and then I'll move on uh, in the sector studies uh, to the communications sector next, uh, trying to get all of the sector studies videos done by the end of this year. In terms of the 11 sectors, there are, uh, when we do these understanding videos, there are 163 sub-industries. If you're using uh, the GICS uh, classification system, there are 163 sub-industries the goal over the uh, coming years is to have an understanding video on each of the 163 sub-industries. Last week, the story continued to be the bear steepener. If we look at the uh, two-year all the way to the 30-year, uh, last week they all hit new highs with the 20 and 30 ending the week at the uh, highs of their yield. Look at these moves uh, on the 20 and 30, 21 and 22 basis points. Uh, even the 7 and the 10, 18 and 19. I heard this uh, on uh, Bloomberg, this bear steepener uh, being called orderly, that this is an orderly bear steepening. Uh, when you have a 30 year moving 20 basis points a week, that's that's a little outside of orderly, I would say. On money market rates, uh, the three-month uh, and the four-month uh, hit new uh, high yields as well. Uh, for the most part, money market rates are being well-behaved, uh, as they would be, because they're reflecting monetary policy, and the preponderance of the probability is still on no, uh, no rate hikes. Uh, over the next uh, two meetings into the end of the year. That's where the weight of the probabilities are. I think that makes a lot of sense because I think we really, when we look at uh, real yields, I think we really have to focus more on the level of the real yield now in terms of monetary policy uh, than the level of the nominal yield. And real yields, um, all of them uh, increased last week uh, and all of them hit records last week and they didn't move a little. But these are uh, very big moves uh, on the long end of the curve. Uh, inversion uh, is reducing even more. Uh, look at this. The 5 to the 10 is now positive. The 2 to the 20, the 10 to the 30 uh, is positive. Uh, the 2 to the 10 still inverted, negative 30 basis points. In Canada, it is negative 70 basis points. The more damaging one is the 3 month to the 10 year, negative 85 basis points. Canada, it is almost 100 basis points. For this uh, to go flat, to go zero, your 10-year, because I don't expect the three-month uh, to, to really give way. Uh, that is going to hold very tight to where monetary policy is. So the 10-year is going to have to do all the heavy lifting on that one. 4.78, adding 85 uh, more basis points. Uh, your 5.6, a little north of 5.6% on a 10-year. Uh, which would probably put the 30-year uh, uh, in, uh, in the same range. And there's always this uh, odd uh, kink uh, at the 20-year. That would make the 20-year uh, kind of desirable, pushing over 6%. I don't know that it, uh, it gets there without breaking a lot of things along the way. Uh, we'll look at the uh, mortgage uh, rate soon. We'll uh, look at the potential damage it could be causing there. The Fed balance sheet, uh, the asset runoff, another $28 billion, down to $7.301 trillion. Uh, at the rate it's running off, we should see a six-handle uh, before the end of the year, uh, under $7 trillion. Uh, the balance sheet itself is now under eight trillion, seven point nine five five, down forty six billion. Twenty eight was runoff, which means there was another net eighteen billion dollar runoff on the balance sheet. Let's not forget that that uh, is uh, is reducing as well. 
Money market funds still continue to draw money. Look at this. Look at this week. $64 billion this week. Retail up $26 billion. Institutions up $38 billion. Uh, government uh, from retail governments up 15.39. Institutions up 37.19. Prime 7.8 here. And a little less than a billion here. November FOMC meeting 24 days away. The probability of nothing has now dropped. It was 86%. That jobs report brought it down to 72.9%, uh, with the rest being on 25 basis points. Nothing more. There's nothing on the 50. For December 13th, uh, having no rate increases, staying at 5.5, still has the weight of probability on it over 50%, 57.6 but down from 63.7, and uh, the 6 has gone from 3.7 uh, to 5.7, although I wouldn't read anything into that. Uh, hedging activity alone could make it appear uh, that there is some probability going on here, so I think I would just pay attention to the 5.5 and the 5.75. The, um, the jobs report um, numbers were good, um, but if we look at the average hourly earnings, because uh, some market participants see that as a proxy for wage inflation, although the ECI is the wage inflation number to look at, which we get at the end of this month, um, that was unchanged. That was flat month over month, uh, point two. Uh, when I say unchanged, it still was growth, but it was the, the rate of growth was the same as the month before, point two, which is a 2.5% annualized uh, annualized value and the Fed feels that uh, wage inflation has to be 3.5 percent or lower to be consistent with 2 percent overall uh, PCE and it's under that uh, 3.5 so if uh, they were looking at that and their mandate uh, is full employment uh, and uh, price uh, stability uh, full employment boxes check no need to cut rates there uh, as far as price stability, it came in lower than the 3.5, a 2.5. No need to raise. So I don't know that uh, that this that this move from 86% down to 73 was really justified. Um, September minutes. It's a busy week uh, this week for uh, central bank risk. Anything that deals with inflation uh, and any kind of communication from the central bank is risk. September uh, minutes we get in three days. We'll see what the tone of the conversation was there and I think there probably is not going to be much new information in that than what we got last week from the Fed speakers and look at this week. We got a full calendar uh, here this week of Fed speak. Um, September PPI in three days. September CPI in four days. This is using the economic calendar. I don't know if these things uh, are supposed to be reversed. If CPI is actually in three and PPI in four, the calendar I looked at has PPI in three, CPI in four, because Monday's a holiday. CPI is getting pushed down. Uh, not the Fed's preferred number, but PCE uh, usually moves in lockstep with CPI. Uh, so we'll see what uh, CPI has for us on on Thursday, keeping in mind that it's the core that we want to pay attention to because energy prices will cause the headline potentially to be higher than it, uh, than it would be. But food and energy typically stripped out. It's the core we want to look at. Uh, earnings season uh, begins. Now, there have been some Q3 earnings that have come out already, but it really isn't the kickoff of the start of earnings season. And when the financials, the big financials start reporting, that's usually seen as the beginning of it. And because it's a holiday, there seems to be some discrepancy on uh, the schedule of when uh, companies are reporting. The only consistent one I've seen is Citigroup uh, beginning Friday morning. One calendar I saw had all the big banks the week after. Uh, another one uh, had it uh, on the same day as Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, etc. So we'll look at both calendars and, you know, just be aware during the week uh, uh, what they are once we get more clarity. Monday, Logan, Barr, Jefferson. Tuesday, Bostick, Waller, Kashkari, Daly. Wednesday, Bowman, Waller, Bostick. 
Thursday. Bostic again, in case you didn't hear him Wednesday uh, or Tuesday. And Friday, you have Harker. Uh, New York Fed. This is really interesting here. New York Fed, the uh, effective federal funds rate is 5.33%. Look at the reverse repo. Uh, it always spikes at the end of the month. Uh, always spikes because bank liquidity uh, needs spike at the end of every quarter and at the end of every year. Uh, and there is a smaller end of month effect, but it's bigger at the end of the quarter and bigger at the end of the year. Uh, 1.55, we saw that it did move up last week uh, when I uh, showed it. But look what happens uh, here. Uh, we would expect it uh, as it goes to the end of the quarter to move up and then come back down. But it really came down 1.283, uh, down $274 billion, 1.28. That is since the resolution of the debt ceiling, uh, the reverse repo is down a trillion dollars. Uh, only because there's T-bill issuance. So there is some concern that with all the supply, is, is, are, are, are there going to be uh, investors that want to pick it up? And we're seeing money flowing into money market funds every week, into government funds every week, and uh, the reverse repo was down a trillion because there's T-bill issuance. So there is appetite for it. It is being taken up. Uh, our lags, 12-month uh, lag, uh, 12 months ago, the effective federal funds rate was 3.08%. It is now 5.33%. The difference between those two numbers is 225 basis points. So if we think that uh, interest rate uh, increases work with a lag, and we say, well, some of it works right away, some of it takes a while, some of it can take up to two years, but we have a weighted average of, let's say, 12 months, then there is 225 basis points of hikes yet to be felt in the economy. This is more theoretical. Uh, there is no uh, objective number here. It is, how do you feel about that? Uh, there are some uh, that argue that, no, there are no lag effects. Uh, the interest rate effect is felt right away at the next incremental borrower and anybody with floating rate debt. But that cannot be true. If I have a mortgage with a fixed rate and I have no debt, I am immune from interest rate hikes until I actually go and incur debt, whether it be through a lease, uh, whether it be on my credit card, whether it be a HELOC, whether it be something, I won't feel it until I actually enter that credit market. So I don't know that I would say there is no lag, but I don't know that I'd uh, uh, say that everybody is is uh, is immune. Uh, so I seem to think that any uh, my the the rough calculations I had done before I got to about ten and a half months, just based on looking at consumer credit uh, and looking at the uh, divisions of consumer credit, how much of it was floating versus how much was fixed. I get to about ten and a half months, so somewhere between a hundred and two hundred and twenty-five points. Uh, of interest rate hikes still need to be felt. Have a look at real rates. Uh, all of them last week uh, hit their cycle highs. The 5 and the 7 did it on Tuesday before uh, ADP gave them some reprieve and the 10, the 20, and the 30 followed the jobs report uh, and ended the week at their cycle highs. Look at the moves too. 20 basis points, 22, 23, 22, 21. You could say, well, you know, there's your 25 basis point increase. If Fed officials wanted another 25 basis points or thought it would be appropriate for by the end of the year, you've got it on the real rates. Uh, according to the summary of economic projections, the long-term, the 2026 and onwards long-term uh, target rate is 2.5 percent we can infer from that that they believe that to be uh, their neutral rate and that's a nominal rate their uh, target for inflation is two percent uh, so you have 0.5 percent uh, which would be the real uh, neutral rate um, and uh, look at these 258 251 247 roughly about 2.5 so you have uh, restrictive territory here by about 200 basis points. Even the Fed funds rate at 5.33, last PCE came in at 3.5, you have 183 basis points in real territory. Uh, it is sufficiently restrictive. Now, previous, uh, if we go back a year, when the market did this, made room, uh, raised rates before the Fed raised rates, the argument was, well, listen, 
the market's already opened up 50 basis points uh, in the uh, in the rates, the Fed would just be filling in the hole. They wouldn't be, you know, if they raised 50 basis points, they'd just be filling in a hole that the market already dug. You might say the same thing here. If real rates have already added 25 basis points, uh, and if the Fed did increase rates by 25 basis points at the next meeting, are they not just filling a hole the market already dug? They're, they're actually not increasing rates. Uh, the market has already done that. They're just playing catch up with the market at this point. I think the difference between last year and this year is last year the market moved in anticipation of the Fed moving. I don't think that that's what this is here. Uh, these increases in the real rates I don't think are in anticipation of the Fed moving. I think it has more to do with the dynamics going on in the fixed income market of which we will look at to, to figure out well you know we hear about all this supply coming online but you know when I look at other other big issuances in the fixed income market they're down year over year so uh, while one issuer the government has a lot of supply uh, the fixed income market is a certain size it has to buy something and if some issuers are really down it must have to go somewhere else so what about all the fixed income securities are the is the supply of them up or down so we'll look at that but i'm jumping ahead there uh, in break-even rates uh, look what's going on with the break-even rates uh, they're they're dropping here uh, which uh, sort of suggests that the market is not really making room for the Fed here in anticipation of an increase, but that they're responding to something else. And because of that, I think the Fed can look at this. The uh, question is, will they, right? I think they can look at this and say, look, we wanted 25 basis points. We want to get into more restrictive territory. It's already there. The market has already done it. Uh also, if, uh, if it was moving in anticipation, we would have seen more activity in the Fed Funds futures. Uh, January uh, 94.55, implying a rate of 5.45. Uh, the week before, it was implying a rate of 5.425. So that is an increase. I have a minus sign here. That is an increase of only 2.5 basis points uh, week over week. So I don't know that these moves week over week are implying that there's a rate hike because I think this would have been more than 2.5 basis points. Even going out to mid-year next year uh, in June, 94.77, that's 5.23. Last week was 5.235. Hasn't changed anything, um, half a basis point. But you do have a drop of 22 basis points uh, from January, uh, the end of January, uh, to June, implying one rate cut sometime between February and the end of June. Uh, December 24, uh, one month so for 4.65. December 23, 5.44. Uh, negative 79 basis points versus negative 70 uh, the week before. Let's have a look at TLT again. Same story. Ugly, ugly, ugly. Down 4.19%. Uh, this uh, this was the initial reaction off the jobs report, big sell-off, and then it uh, recovered and you know just sort of drifted sideways into the end of the day, down 4.19. SPY eked out a small gain, 0.48. Implied volatility is back, uh, at least here on uh, TLT. 13 week at 97 percent, 26 week at 98 percent, and 52 week at 85 percent. Uh, last week uh, on Friday morning uh, after the uh, reaction, this big sell-off down here, I sold more TLT, uh, which gave me a 2023 20, realized loss. And then I added to the 2048 at 518. That's a 25-year bond yielding 5.18. Uh, my after-tax cost, uh, or sorry, my after-tax uh, return on that because of my move to Costa Rica and considering the 30% uh, withholding on the coupon is 4.28 4.28 uh, for me uh, in Canada to get to get an after tax uh, uh, return of 4.28 I'd have to find a coupon of almost 9% uh, 
uh, on on a 25 year bond they simply don't exist uh, so it just I fall into this nice little crack of, of, of avoiding most of the taxes with the move that I have so these are great moves for me uh, it's uh, uh, the benefit is even better for me because I am taking a realized loss on TLT uh, which is going to offset the capital gains I have this year and yes even with uh, beta beating me up and duration beating me up I still I still have uh, capital gains and facing a capital gains tax so this right away lowers my tax hit which is an immediate return and I am moving into the same duration as TLT it and I've said this before it is a different security so the wash rule doesn't apply here however I have the same factor exposure the same factor exposure which means if there is a recovery uh, in the long end of the curve because I have the same duration I've found a bond that has the same duration as TLT does I will have the same uh, return that TLT does with a yield that's about 100 basis points higher than what TLT is yielding based on its dividend so same duration uh, so just by taking the loss I get a, an immediate return based on tax savings right away I get an immediate return uh, and I've moved into a different but extremely adjacent security I think that's beautiful implied volatility on TLT 21.7 look at historical volatility 16.14 um, here I've calculated here my return after tax 4.28 I would need 9.2 percent because interest is taxed at my marginal tax rate 53.5 percent uh, and that is not uh, taking uh, into account uh, the loss that I have that I can offset other capital gains I would need 9.2 percent pre-tax on bonds staying in Canada if I were to stay here I would have to find something at 9.2 to get the same 4.28 after tax okay excitement in the mortgage market here 30-year fixed rate mortgage 7.49 uh, based on uh, uh, Freddie the primary uh, mortgage market survey there are different rates that you can look at uh, mortgage news daily uh, publishes uh, a rate uh, as well uh, this is as of Thursday 7.49 percent and as of Thursday the 10-year was up 13 basis points week over week Thursday over Thursday FRM 18 so the spread increased by five basis points uh, the spread right now uh, if you take the 30-year fixed rate 749 minus the 10-year you have 277 basis points the average spread is 175 here's the spread right here uh, using Fred going all the way back to the early 90s and there's 1.75 you could see uh, periods of time below periods of time above below above but basically hung very close to 1.75 look where we're headed now uh, hit a peak uh, higher than uh, than uh, over here hit a peak this was re a lot of stress in the mortgage market here and it didn't break 3% June 1st 3.105 uh, sitting at 2.77 right now that is a huge spread this spread by the way all this over here this is what mortgage reads play so they'll buy MBS uh, which has both a spread uh, and a risk-free component and they will short uh, US Treasury futures uh, to uh, eliminate this they will try as best they can to nullify that to get rid of interest rate risk they have the spread and then they will lever that up uh, that spread so as they're reinvesting uh, their proceeds they're reinvesting in very large spreads well if you have uh, an average spread of 175 at some point this is going to uh, and it always does especially when it gets to extremes it always uh, mean reverts back to its to its average level of 175 as that spread contracts you're going to have fair value market gains on the income statement uh, right now uh, they're being beaten up look at agency down 5.4 annually down 5.79 uh, because they're going to be facing as this spread widens they face fair value uh, fair value losses so their net income looks terrible but you can't look at their net income uh, you have to look at at their uh, net interest 
income and dollar roll income, which are sitting at, uh, uh, at very high levels. It's come off the highest. They're not setting records, uh, but they're nice and big. And then you have to look at their cash flow because, again, the fair market value losses are not cash flow. And if you're assessing its ability to pay dividends, you can't do it as a percentage of their net income. You have to look at it as a percentage of their cash flow. Uh, and they're reinvesting in these wide spreads right now. So when it does mean revert, uh, they will, uh, I think, significantly outperform. Uh, I like them because I think they can continue uh, to pay their dividend. And when you get that dividend, you get to buy them at, at these uh, lower, more attractive prices. Uh, I think extremely attractive prices. And at some point, this will, this will correct. Uh, you're not going to find a new equilibrium at these higher points. Uh, but average of 175, the spread sitting at 277. Uh, Arbor down uh, 10%, uh, more susceptible to interest rates uh, there, 10% down. Uh, look at the housing stocks. Look at Havnanian down 15.51. This is such a volatile stock, such a volatile stock, and the crime, the absolute crime, uh, CME, is that there are no options on this. There are no options on this, and this thing moves. Maybe it moves that much because there are no options. They could probably reduce volatility if they moved some of that volume into the options. Uh, DHI uh, down 2.95, Lennar 2.68, all of them down. KB Homes 4.41, uh, Toll Brothers 4.03. Uh, the uh, higher this goes, the worse this gets. Uh, which I think is uh, is setting up a nice buying opportunity on the home builders into the next cycle, uh, because I do think you have four or five years where these uh, where these uh, will continue to be winners until you uh, rebalance the housing market uh, in the U.S. IYR doing the right thing, finally under eighty bucks. I don't know why it held on for so long, but uh, it's 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 responding now. PLD uh, down, DLR down as well, and XHBITB down. OAS is, I don't know if it's too early to start saying, aha, look what's going on. Finally, they're coming along for the ride, but high yield uh, sitting at 4.38. Uh, the spread widened 7%. 7, uh, 7 uh, double B's widened 8%, uh, triple C's widened 6%, triple B's widened 5%. So all uh, big moves based on, on, uh, on, on widening of the spread, but still relatively low spreads. The, the highs uh, were set uh, uh, quite some time ago. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, we have to go back to last July for these. Uh, this is last October, last July. Not the July that passed, but July of 2022. These are all 2022 uh, numbers. I don't know that, that we really signal a lot of stress in high yield till you get to about 800. 800 is usually, uh, usually the point uh, where we say there is some serious trouble going on. 600, uh, we got the 599. We're sitting at 438. Still a ways to go. 981. Still below uh, 10 on this one, but still at one point it was below eight. A couple of weeks ago it was below eight, and this was uh, uh, two point. Well, it was lower than 2.8 for a while. Uh, here we were at 12.89. Here you'll see stress 18 uh, to 20, 18 uh, percent to 20 percent, and uh, this one here usually above two. Uh, but, uh, you know, some movement over here, if there was no movement, I would have had to send the doctors in for a pulse uh, uh, to see what's going on in that market. But at least at least you're getting something. OK, let's uh, look at uh, the fixed income market. SIFMA has its uh, uh, updated numbers as of September 29th, which was the last trading day of, uh, of September, last trading day of Q3. Uh, so we do have September 23 uh, data on all these charts. Corporate bond, and this is just issuance. We have to be very careful with issuance because it doesn't tell us whether the total amount outstanding uh, has increased or decreased. Now you may say, well, year to date, you've issued 2.9% more bonds uh, than the year before. There must be more outstanding, but there are maturities all the time during the 
first nine months of 2023, some bonds did mature and you have issuance. This is just issuance. Uh, it, uh, it is not net issuance, it's gross issuance, up 2.9% year over year. But I'm certain you've had maturities over that period of time. Uh, this is a September 23 over here uh, for issuance investment grade 132.5 and high yield uh, 23 billion, uh, which if you look back over the last uh, uh, 12 months, uh, I think only May and April came close to that. So there is still appetite. If it was issued, it was bought. There's still appetite uh, for these bonds at, uh, at these yields. ABS. Uh, Year-to-date issuance down 21.3%. Uh, if we look at U.S. Treasuries issuance, this is the big one, right? Issuance is up 25.6% year over year. 15.7 trillion uh, was issued. But we have to be careful here because there are maturities as well. We know for the first nine months of the year, the U.S. did not add 15.7 trillion to its outstanding debt. So we know that there are maturities. So if there's a given week where there is $100 billion going up, there is a lot of focus on that supply. Look at the supply that's going on. But you also have to look in that particular week and say, well, what if there is $80 billion uh, in maturities? Well, that $80 billion has got to roll over into something else. So uh, you do have uh, your maturities create an automatic market for your issuance. You really only need the net issuance, but SIFMA doesn't give us net issuance. We only have gross issuance. But be aware that the size of the fixed income market is not just a function of issuance. It's a function of net issuance. So the question is, are there more fixed income securities today than there were at this time last year. You may think with all the government debt out there, there must be. Uh, but look at MBS. This is uh, U.S. fixed income securities issuance uh, year to date down 12.5%. This is everything, right? U.S. Treasuries, MBS, corporate bonds, munis, agency, ABS. Uh, MBS down 45.4% year to date. Uh, munis down 12.4% year to date. ABS down 21.3%. So if we think about fixed income funds and the fixed income market and fixed income allocations among funds, you've got to put your money into some fixed income security somewhere. So there is a focus on some issuers having a lot of supply. But as a market for the market as a whole, when we're looking at year to date issuance being down 12.5% on the fixed income market as a whole, um, we can look at the U.S. Treasuries, look at the bid to cover. Why is, it, why is it still holding up? If we accept the supply argument that, well, yields are going up because of all of the supply, the bid to cover is healthy, uh, and the issuance in the fixed income market is down 12.5% for the first nine months of 2023 over the first nine months of 2022 because we can't just look at one segment of the market. Think about it in terms of equities. Think about one company that is just issuing a lot of stock uh, versus a market dominated by buybacks. Uh, if you were pricing out the market, if you uh, had equity funds that had to be in the market, the market would be going up simply because you have money that is chasing fewer and fewer security holdings. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that there is not just a size of the fixed income market in terms of investors. Uh, money flows into here all the time because wealth is created around the world all the time and it has to go somewhere. Uh, wealth is flying into sovereign wealth funds. It's flying into pensions every week, every two weeks. Uh, that money has to find a home. So because the amount of dollars that need to be invested are increasing, you need increasing sizes of markets. So yeah, there's a lot of focus on, look how much they're issuing. Uh, but uh, there is a supply and there is demand. Demand comes from investment dollars flowing in. Supply comes from those that want to sell. If we look at the fixed income market as a whole, Lack of supply, lack of supply, lack of supply. However, dollars have to go somewhere. 
And if we're concerned about the U.S. paying its debt, an entity that can actually print money, engineer interest rates, raise taxes, uh, charge service fees, can generate the revenue it needs any time. We're concerned about that, but we're not concerned about high yield because, wow, uh, go ahead and issue $23 billion. There's a market for that. Uh, and the spread, ah, you know, we're good under a thousand basis points, even for triple C, which is very questionable debt. We're good with that. It's just the U.S. government that can print money and raise taxes we're worried about. Come on. Okay, on to SPY. Then we'll look at the earnings calendar. And then I'll just put a question mark there and say, I, I think we'll have to keep watching for the week. Now, I could have figured it out. I could have just went to each and every company company's website and investor relations and see when 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 they were reporting it and I thought ah it's just too much work I'll wait I'll wait for somebody on Bloomberg to tell me during the week who's reporting on Friday forward four quarter operating earnings we have to jump forward one quarter now we are in Q4 of 23 all the way to Q3 of 24 because uh, some companies for Q3 have already reported um, 239.93 and again we are falling forward one quarter here so that's why it's uh, up from the 230 239.00 uh, IBS uh, SP Global 237.98 uh, SPX closing 4308.50 that is spot which uh, puts uh, the forward multiple at 18.03 times uh, 19 a multiple of 19 would get it to 40 547 a multiple of 17 we get it down to 4070 based on um, the forecasts that I'm seeing for year end and there let's not call them forecasts based on uh, best guesses from industry participants that do this sort of thing uh, I'm seeing anywhere from a 42 to a 46 uh, for the uh, uh, for the meteor part of the uh, uh, the guesses with some guesses coming in below, and I think only one coming in below uh, 4,000. Um, implied volatility uh, kind of, you know, at the highs, but easing off from 95% down to 91, 88% at, uh, at 26 weeks, but still uh, on a one-year basis uh, rather low. So we have earnings that begin this week, and this will be, I think, a critical test. You have, uh, you know, sort of two camps uh, that seem that seem to be equally balanced, uh, and you have uh, in this camp over here interest rates, uh, uh, nominal and real interest rates uh, that uh, are rising and will, at the margin, hurt the weakest companies that are sitting in front of them. They are going to hurt. In fact, one we saw a pretty substantial company get hurt was uh, in the utilities sector was NextEra. Uh, not so much NextEra, but NEP, NextEra Partners, which is a publicly traded company of which NextEra Energy owns, I think, 55% of. And uh, they had an investment plan in place that would have allowed them to grow uh, their, uh, their uh, distributions by about 12% a year. Uh, and what they've done is they've said, uh, let's just cancel that uh, based on where the cost of debt is, based on where the cost of equity is and the cost of getting things done. Issuing equity at this time doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Uh, let's lower this to 6% uh, instead, which means we don't really need uh, any kind of growth capital till 2026, 2027. Uh, so we're out of the market for that period of time. So rather than take on uh, more capital at a higher cost, uh, they simply just uh, took a hit and lowered their growth forecast to 6%, and they took a hit, and NextEra, which owns NextEra Energy Partners, also took a hit on that as well. So it's not just smaller firms uh, where they can't handle any more rate increases. It's larger firms that are saying, we were going to uh, invest uh, according to the schedule in assets, now we're not. Uh, so it is affecting larger companies as well in terms of the decisions they would make about what they're going to do next. Well, then that removes future growth if that is happening. So you have this one camp over here 
saying, you know, this is this is a problem. And then on the other side, you have the economy. Uh, and when I say the economy, I'm primarily talking about jobs because if we look at uh, economic indicators, leading economic indicators, they're not very good. If we look at um, PMIs, um, they're not very good either. Manufacturing has been in contraction for some time. Even looking at the uh, home builders, National Home Builders uh, um, Activity Index uh, went from lows of 40 to 55, moving up and then crashed right back down uh, to 45. Uh, so this is, that would be in this camp over here. Uh, on what we have here is just a jobs market that just seems to not want to quit. The economy continually just adds jobs unless we think that there's something broken in the jobs market. So I got it into my head, you know, what is the most objective thing that I can look at? The most objective because uh, these this is survey based, right? Uh, the most objective thing that I can look at is electricity use. Well, electricity use is tied very closely to economic activity. So why not have a look at where electricity use is to see if there is actually something going on here or it's a bit of an illusion. And we'll do that uh, in, uh, in a second here. So um, where are we on the market? Uh, flip a coin. I don't know which one is going to win. I don't know that there's ever been a time where I've had this much indecision. Uh, where I could go either way. Uh, I don't know. So I'm sort of glad that, that, that I have to move out of things and uh, into assets that can move across a border nicely um, because I'm just in this phase of my life where I'm leaving one country and going to another. I've got to step aside for a bit. I, I miss the excitement. I'm looking at some things saying, oh, I, but I want some of that and I want some of this and I got to I gotta hold back. But Overall, I'm glad that I don't actually have to make a lot of decisions here because honestly, I don't know. I really just don't know at this point. Uh, I, don't, I don't expect earnings to be uh, a, a, a sword that kills this market. I, I don't expect it. I think earnings will be the same as it was the last two quarters. It'll come in above lowered expectations and the market will say, see, everything seems to be fine. Will margins hold up? I think in the earnings season, I don't know that the EPS numbers are going to be as important as our margins holding up. Uh, I think that'll be probably looked at more, but that takes time to figure out. Uh, so I would say that uh, peak caution is warranted, I think both in bonds uh, and in equities, which seems rather odd because usually... Uh, when you got to get away from one, you kind of run into the arms of the other. Well, both of them have their doors locked on you now. Okay, this is the EIA has electric power monthly table 5.1 sales of electricity to ultimate customers. You have residential, commercial, industrial, transportation. Industrial and commercial, uh, when it comes to electricity, are uh, more cyclical. Industrial is the most cyclical, followed by commercial. Residential is the least cyclical. Uh, so if we're looking for any clues, we'd find it in industrial and maybe in commercial. Uh, transportation. Uh, we can see here that it was fairly constant for quite some time. Then the pandemic hit 2020 and it dropped. It still hasn't recovered. 2020, 2021, 2022 still hasn't recovered to these levels. Uh, because due to a lot of work from home. Uh, so let's just look at industrial and commercial. We can scroll down here. Uh, we have good numbers up to the end of 2022. Uh, and let's go to, uh, there's 2023. We do have some numbers for the months of 2023. If we look at industrial January, 79 to 82 to 84 to 89, uh, moving up. And you look at uh, um, commercial 110 to 132. But you could be getting seasonal effects in there, right? Here's the year to date, and here's the rolling 12 months. So 2021, 2022, 2023, and year to date, I think this is up to uh, July of 2023. So it's only the first seven months that we have, but let's see what's going on. Um, 
let's look at uh, this column here, which is industrial 572. Uh, for 2022, it was 585. For 2023, it's 574. So it's lower than 2022, but on par with 2021, 574, a little bit higher at 572. Looking at uh, commercial, 756 to 789 to 783. This is not falling off a cliff. It's not growing. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, indicating that, wow, look at these numbers expanding. You know, I, I don't know that we can say there's clear expansion going on, but I, I don't see sharp economic contraction. You would see a lot more variability in these numbers. The rolling 12 months ending in July. Uh, here we do see a little bit of something here in industrial. Uh, we do see a drop here, but that's not falling off a cliff. That's a small little drop. And we have stability in, uh, in commercial uh, and in residential. We have a, a slight drop over here, but that could uh, simply be due uh, to uh, whenever you have energy efficiency. Uh, it tends to, in the residential, because it's so big in the residential sector, it tends to hit there. Also, the rollout of solar panels on, on rooftops will take off uh, some, uh, some usage over time. Based on these numbers, I'm just not seeing uh, I'm just not seeing a big roll off uh, going on. Uh, if we look at gasoline usage, uh, rolling 12 months, uh, 2022 64 here at 66, implying more uh, more driver miles going on. Even uh, looking at year to date, 2021 37 uh, up to 38 29. Now it's 38 95. It could be more of these uh, back to work mandates that is causing that to happen. But going back to the two circles I had, you still have interest rates on one side, you have the economy on the other side. We're not getting any, any significant hint here uh, that the economy is rolling over based on electricity usage. Now, that being said, we're also not getting any indication here uh, that the economy is expanding uh, in quite the same way that the job market is expanding. Uh, again, if we look at industrial rolling 12 months, uh, it's actually down. Uh, whereas a uh, commercial tends to be uh, tends to be flat. Okay, looking at the document from Refinitiv Thursday, we have four companies: Domino's, Walgreens, Delta, and Fastenal. And on Friday, uh, you got some big banks: Citigroup, BlackRock. Well, that's not a bank. Uh, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, you've also got BlackRock, Progressive, PNC, and United Health. If we look at the S and P, uh, sorry, the SP Global uh, uh, spreadsheet uh, for uh, the 9th to the 13th, uh, they only have these companies listed: PepsiCo, Domino's, Fastenal, Walgreens, Citigroup, and United Health. Uh, I don't see BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo in there, and even into the next week, uh, I don't see them. They just seem to be missing. So uh, I have noticed that in the last three four weeks the sp global spreadsheet hasn't been keeping up with uh refinitive uh, which is why i've uh, switched back to that one so maybe there's something going on there we're unaware of uh, but um maybe maybe it just has uh fallen off as being an important uh, a, an important thing maybe it's just too much work i don't know it just seems to be lagging so i would uh, uh rely more on uh the uh, refinitive.com uh, website uh, for for the earnings calendar. There are earnings calendars everywhere. You can actually just Google an earnings calendar and get it. If you have interactive brokers, it does have an earnings calendar as well. Uh, it has an economic calendar. It has a really great calendar with a whole bunch of things, dividends, corporate events, things like that. Uh, you can uh, simply just use that calendar. Whichever calendar gets you gets you the data. I'm trying to give you stuff that uh, is freely available. Not everyone has interactive brokers, so you don't have it. But if we can find free sources uh, on the internet uh, that have that have valid good data, that's what we're looking for. That's it for the week.